Major David Collett and I commanded A Company 3 Para on the Mount Longdon assault. Um, before I go into the actual assault, I'll just give a bit of background detail of my whereabouts before I move through B Company. My initial objective was to take wing forward, and then once that taken and the mountain taken itself, we were then going to probably push forward to Wireless Ridge. Uh, my company was a conventional company of three platoons, but in addition, I had two sections of the anti tank platoon and I'd formed them into a, a company headquarters support group, which I'd also grouped my 384s from the platoon. So the platoons did not have any anti-tank weapons except for the 66s. We moved forward onto our objective without much in incident initially, because most of the advance was done in dead ground from the enemy. However, on going over the top of the ridge, we began to receive initially, I think, overshoots from the enemy, and then direct sniper fire and machine gun fire from what were, appeared to us from our position to be well-sighted uh, sniper positions using night scopes. During that time, I lost two men from sniper uh, sh rifle fire, both being head injuries. We then went to ground due to the intensity of the fire and waited while B Company carried out their assault. I was unable to move forward because of the sniper fire, so the colonel ordered me back and to move around through the B Company position and then continue the advance through B Company. When getting onto the position, I met up with Major Mike Argue, who commanded B Company. He then explained the position to me using an air photograph and a map, and I then formulated a plan. The problem I had was that the ground to my front sloped away from me, and it was open ground. Also, the enemy on the, f on the next feature, which was full back, had a series of 5.0 and GPMG machine gun positions, which were continually firing bursts in the area of my start line. Two platoon, I was going to use two platoons forward and one in reserve, um, two, two platoon itself and one platoon. Because of the weight of our webbing, I decided to ditch, the, the assault platoons would ditch their webbing to give them a, um, freedom of movement. And I also decided to move one platoon forward at a time. For the actual move, the FOO was moved forward to, give, to start putting down artillery fire, as were the MFCs. And I also moved the company headquarters support group forward with two GPMGs in a, a forward slope position, which was actually fairly vulnerable to start to try and suppress the 5.0 and the GPMGs. The advance forward um, by Tubtoon was begun by initially a section virtually going over the top, and they virtually had to move from rock to rock, one man following another, because of the, the lack of cover on the forward slope. And so the, the initial advance of A Company was slow. But I had told them that I didn't want any casualties, if they could possibly help it, and to clear the enemy position as quickly but as safely as they could. And this they did, using grenades and 66s. And in fact, our only casualty in the initial phase was of, uh, uh, one of our own grenades exploding and injuring a man in the arm. Once two platoon had crossed over the ridge, I then, I then told them to keep to the north and two platoon then moved across and started advancing to the south. So I had a platoon on either side of the ridge line. And the GPMGs of the headquarter company group still continued firing. I might add at that stage, we had fired a considerable number of rounds, and it was ammunition, in fact, at that stage for the gun was becoming critical. And if we had had to give covering fire for much longer, um, the guns would have actually had to cease firing. The, the, the move through the enemy position was done under cover of darkness and in the mist. So the extent of the position was not really known to us until we had reached the end and first light began to dawn. 
Fortunately for us, the mist stayed down, so although we could see our, the position we were on, we couldn't actually be observed by the enemy around us. And we then found out that it was actually a very extensive position with very well-made Sangers, a large number of 5.0 and GPMG positions, and also a recallless rifle, which had been giving us trouble the night before. In addition, we found a 120mm base plate with two 120mm. The reorganization itself, my, the colonel had told me that I must not expose myself either to the east or to the south because enemy positions were still occupied in these two, namely Wireless Ridge in the, in the east and Tumbledown Mountain in the south. I therefore organized, I had to organize my company in a linear position on the north side of the ridge. We had to first obviously get our web equipment brought forward and the reserve platoon brought these forward to the, f the other two platoons. We, because of the, the nature of the ground, the only positions we could occupy were the Argentinian Sangers which they had left. And in fact, we found these in the days to come to be a very effective um, positions. On first light, sporadic, sporadic enemy fire was received onto position, but because they didn't know our exact location, it was very sporadic and very inaccurate. Um, one or two enemy were seen running to the running or moving eastward along the bottom of our position, and these were engaged with small arms. As the mist lifted, so the enemy artillery fire began to fall in around us. Um, the position was that on Mount Tumbledown there was probably a, a, a very strong position which later the Scots Guards took. They had well-sighted RCLs and sniper positions facing, our, facing north in fact, two of my men from 3 platoon were held down by enemy sniper fire on the, on the south side of the ridge for four hours um, because they just couldn't move from, because of the accuracy of the fire. And it took artillery, mortars, GPMGs to suppress these snipers before you could get these men back onto the, onto the north side of the ridge. The whole scene began to get unreal as the light, be as the mist began to lift. Um, below us and around us we could see Argentinians wandering around, oblivious to the fact that we were overlooking them. And on the same, on the same hand, our own soldiers seemed to be oblivious to the fact that the Argentinians could see them. Uh, they were wandering around, even with sh shell fire falling around them, seemingly oblivious to it. Um, I think probably this was due a lot to the inexperience or the, the fact that they did not know what shells could do to a man because the following day after we had lost one of our men through shell fire, he was caught in the open on, an, on a resupply detail, the soldiers became distinctly more aware of the artillery and tended to stay underground a lot more. Um, there was no doubt that the enemy could observe us very clearly and they did um, use their FOOs with considerable accuracy. Um, in one case, I had an O group going on. They obviously waited till I had all the officers present and then started firing at us. And it was quite amusing to watch all the platoon commanders bobbing around because I, being in the strongest sang of the lot, could sit back and watch them. Um, but it was a worrying time. We didn't have any counter bombardment facilities. They were firing five fives at us from Stanley, and our, our, artillery, range, our, our artillery was out of range at the time. So it was virtually a case of sitting where we were and accepting the punishment. However, contrary to the, to the teachings I had as a, a young subaltern that you don't occupy enemy positions, uh, we found that these were the safest positions to be in. This um, then was A Company's ordeal on Longdon itself. The actual assault we had was not difficult from the point of view of the enemy were beginning to break up as we assaulted. The time, w w which was when it was difficult, was actually the two days afterwards, uh, maintaining morale under enemy fire, um, shell fire, which is worse than actually coming under small arms fire. And I think the soldiers, after a time, could dis distinguish between incoming and outgoing rounds, and in fact became veterans within a day of being up on the mountain. 
one thing we did feel that uh, during our time on, on Longdon and being on the forward slope was that the other battalions who attacked both Wireless Ridge and Mount Longdon never came forward, or we never saw them, and asked our advice on the movement of enemy either on Wireless Ridge or on Mount Longdon. And being where we were, si uh, situated on probably the, the forward position of the enemy, of, into the enemy camp, um, we did feel that they could have probably learned a lot more from us than from uh, sitting farther back. So that's one thing, is going forward for reconnaissance. You've heard quite a lot now about our advance across East Stanley and about the battle for Mount Longdon. I want now to um, round off the story and then to summarise with some of the more important points, many of which we have already covered, but I think bear repetition. On the morning of the 14th of June, I was giving out orders to my company commanders at the foot of Mount Longdon in a hailstorm, and I may say, at that stage, getting quite concerned about the physical debilitation and the physical effects on us all, from myself downwards, of the sustained operations which we had now been, un been uh, carrying out for, for several weeks. And I was beginning to uh, become concerned that whilst we could continue to fight indefinitely, uh, we could probably only continue to do so at an increasingly great cost to ourselves. As I gave out these orders, uh, the word was passed um, from my own OPs and from uh, two para, who were by now ahead of us on Wireless Ridge, that the Argentinians appeared to have um, completely collapsed and were pouring back into Stanley. Uh, once this was indeed confirmed as being true, we saddled up and that afternoon, on a, on a uh, bright, frosty, clear, sunny afternoon, we advanced over the forward slopes that you've heard described that would have been subjected a few hours before to very heavy um, and vicious enemy artillery fire we have advanced, almost ran across that ground uh, in great excitement uh, and down through Moody Brook, uh, the objective which my C Company had been due to attack that night uh, along the race course, which again had been one of our objectives for the night of the 14th of June, and by that evening, before last light, we were into Stanley with a feeling above all, I think, of triumphant relief. I was especially relieved, and I'm sure this was reflected throughout the battalion and elsewhere in, in the landing force, that clearly here was a battle that we were bound to win in the end, uh, but we were expecting to have to go on fighting through uh, the Stanley Commons area, probably um, a very messy, nasty fight, uh, which undoubtedly would have cost us more lives, uh, more casualties, and possibly civilian casualties in Stanley as well. And it was an enormous relief knowing that we were bound to win anyway, that the Argentines had suddenly collapsed totally in the manner which they, in which they did. We then spent about uh, 10 days in Stanley, where I may say there was a very severe water problem, and the only time of the whole campaign when I was worried about the, the health of my soldiers was in Stanley, where the water was bad, and where a lot of people did go down with very bad stomach disorders. Um, and during that period, uh, so, uh, some administration went on, uh, reports started to be written, citations for gallantry were written, letters to the next of kin of those who had sadly been killed were written, and we prepared ourselves to embark on the Norland to uh, sail back to the United Kingdom. We sailed back to Ascension Island, and there, from there we flew back, um, having been addressed by the Chief of the General Staff um, on the Norland at Ascension Island. Uh, we then flew back to Bryce Norton and re reunited with our families in early July. Let me return now to some of the, uh, the most important points that I believe bear repetition from what we have told you. And this list is by no means exhaustive. The first is the importance of patrol work. Um, this, like all the other lessons from this campaign is not a new one. Uh, read 
defeat into victory by Field Marshal Slim, and you will hear the same cries being echoed. But the, I believe it's true that the standard of patrolling skills in a battalion does reflect the standards that that battalion attains to. And furthermore, in our experience, the intelligence that came down to us from brigade and higher levels was of general background interest, but was not sufficiently detailed or specific to tell us what we were going to confront on our subsequent objectives. The only way to find out that information, which subunits were deployed where, what the enemy's strengths were, where their machine guns were, what uh, their general situation was, the only way to do that was to get out and to patrol ourselves and to find out that information for ourselves. And I believe that probably holds true in most situations. I may add a caveat here that the danger of patrol clashes was ever present. And we had one very serious one ourselves between a patrol from my A company and a patrol from my C company in the Port San Carlos bridgehead. This is obviously potentially a most damaging um, factor to the morale of uh, the whole battalion. And there must be, in every battalion, a clear-cut system of identifying friendly from enemy patrols, probably by the use of the mini-flare. And that was a lesson we learned the hard way. Infantry skills generally, I believe, the basic infantry skills, that is to say, the ability to march far and to fight hard on your feet. Those infantry skills were not peculiar to the Falkland Islands, and I believe they are very, very relevant indeed to the mechanized warfare of BAOR. Do not ever believe that your tin can is going to stay with you in BAOR throughout the battle. It may well be destroyed very early on, and you will be surviving and fighting and living on your feet and moving possibly long distances on your feet. And I believe it behoves those particularly who serve in Germany to remember that. The importance of firepower, I have already stressed, and it has come out during the other accounts. I have reformed, for example, a machine gun platoon in my battalion since returning, although I did have specialist machine gunners um, from my drums platoon during the course of the Falklands campaign. The value of the Milan uh, against bunkers and rock positions in admittedly an extraordinary situation uh, was very considerable. And I may say that Milan, like many other weapons, was being fired at much closer ranges than we generally trained to fire them at. This applied also to Carl Gustav and it, apl it applied to blowpipe. Generally, it seems in battle, you are firing ranges at shorter, uh, you're firing your weapons at shorter ranges than perhaps you generally do on training. The use of artillery you have heard much about, and this is, as it always has been, absolutely fundamental to the success of any infantry attack. The effect of enemy, enemy artillery fire has also been mentioned to you, and I think this bears repetition. The effect of, uh, that we, of the, the artillery fire that we were subjected to was depressing, and it made us very angry. And I believe uh, that after a number of days of such experience, um, soldiers begin to become um, burdened and depressed and very angry by such fire. This was particularly frustrating because it appeared to us at battalion level that nothing was being done to locate or neutralize or destroy uh, using special forces or air attack or whatever uh, to locate and destroy the main enemy artillery pieces in and around Stanley. We appeared to be um, absolutely helpless in the hands of this fire. The casualties we sustained from artillery fire were generally men who had to move about, uh, particularly stretcher bearers, for example, or those escorting a wounded soldier down the mountain. Uh, in one instance, for example, a soldier wounded by shrapnel was being escorted down the mountain, down a reverse slope, by two of his comrades, and all three were killed by one round of artillery fire. Artillery, one could generally hear whistling in, and in fact, the soldiers became quite expert 
at whether it was going to fall short of them, beyond them, or very close to them. And it was only in the latter instance that they would sometimes take cover. But with enemy mortar fire, this was uh, not always the case. And very often, mortar fire one could not hear whistling in at all, particularly if uh, our own batteries now close up behind us, if they were firing, and the noise was so great that one could not distinguish friend from foe. The enemy artillery threat was also the reason why we could not exploit, as we would have liked to have done, onto Wireless Ridge on the morning of the uh, 13th of, of June, sorry, the 12th of June. Uh, Tumbledown Mountain was still held by the enemy, and that dominated the low uh, rolling terrain of Wireless Ridge, as well as, of course, the, the, the mountainous terrain of Mount Longdon. And I believe that on an exercise, I would undoubtedly have advanced with my battalion across that ridge, and probably the umpires would have given it to me. But in reality, it would have been, I believe, grossly irresponsible and would have led to heavy casualties. And it is significant that two para, although they were close up behind us by this time, to the north of Mount Longdon, they attacked it by night, two nights later, concurrently with the Scots Guards attacking and taking Mount Tumbledown. One cannot afford to flirt with enemy artillery fire. It is too lethal. The command and control difficulties have been touched on. And I would simply re-emphasize here that command and control will be very difficult and that any battle will be chaotic, uh, unpredictable, uh, very hard to control, and very confused. And this particularly, perhaps, applies to the fighting through phase of an attack. And that fighting through phase, in the case of our attack, went on most of the night, and the night lasting in excess of 12 hours by the time we'd closed uh, during darkness with the, with the objective. And therefore, the importance of clear orders, um, the importance of a soldier knowing exactly what his part in the plan is, and his ability, in terms of his confidence and his training, to get on with the job he's been given to do, and not to be reliant on orders minute to minute, or possibly even hour to hour, is absolutely cardinal uh, if an attack by night onto a difficult objective with enemy prepared positions is to be successful. The importance of casualty evacuation and resupply procedures, perhaps uh, at higher levels than, for example, uh, the platoon commander needs to worry about too much, but the importance of practicing those procedures on training cannot be overestimated. They tend to be areas which we pay lip service to on training, and because they are awkward and inconvenient and tend to bring a dramatic exercise, uh, if not to a halt, at least to interfere with its beautiful flow, um, they tend to be procedures which we cut corners on. We do so at our peril. The, uh, the task of evacuating casualties uh, involved my forming an ad hoc platoon of stretcher bearers from such people as cooks and clerks, and very, very well indeed they did. Uh, but it was necessary to have that force, and it was necessary to have it um, commanded and controlled at the right level, and my second in command an officer of that sort of experience was needed to oversee and to run this side of things during that night and indeed after. The same applies to the resupply of ammunition because, uh, as you've heard already, automatic, particularly the belted ammunition for automatic weapons, uh, you use a great deal and you run out of it quite quickly. And it is essential to keep the flow going. And we very often used our stretcher bearers to bring forward ammunition um, prior to them evacuating casualties on those same stretchers as they occurred. Going on from that, of course, the importance of battle first aid at the lowest levels, um, and you've heard this described, is absolutely crucial. And the surgeons, uh, my own surgeon back at T. Linlet, for example, who dealt with most of my ser serious casualties, uh, they, but they all paid tribute to the, the high standard of, of life-saving battle first aid amongst the soldiers. On the one hand, an attack cannot flounder 
because so many soldiers become involved in it. But on the other hand, it is essential that lives are saved at that early stage. And it's at that early stage, before a soldier reaches the RAP, that his life is either saved or probably lost. And so that is a most important matter as well, and one which tends again to be ignored on training. I would emphasize, however, that under no circumstances should the need to deal with casualties interfere with the momentum, uh, the forward momentum of an attack, and this matter was made very, very clear to my soldiers in their briefings before they even left the Canberra. It's not like, like Northern Ireland. You must press on if uh, you are to be successful in securing objectives in conventional war. The matter of robustness is important, I believe, particularly for leaders. I found that there were certain uh, men, non-commissioned officers and officers, who found the conditions and the general environment so demanding and uh, so uh, arduous that they had little uh, left over in, in terms of their inner resources with which to command and to lead and to encourage and to uh, generally uh, take their place in the, in the battle. Uh, there were not many instances of this, but I believe it is uh, very important that in the selection of both officers and NCOs and in their training, that conditions are made as arduous for them as possible, and then uh, they can start thinking about giving out orders, administering their sections or platoons in the field, and so on. Uh, it is no good trying to think you can train officers and non-commissioned officers in the classroom or select you know, the good from the average. You cannot. The confidence and the skills of the individual soldier uh, are ultimately the battle winner, I believe. And also his feeling of being a member of a team. Uh, it is true to say, I think, that as far as team training is concerned, whether it be a gun group, a section, a platoon, or a company, um, that that training should be as close to, to a dress rehearsal for the real thing as possible. And it goes back to my remarks about such matters as resupply and Kazavak. The closer it can, can be made to a dress rehearsal, the more familiar will a soldier be uh, with his task when uh, a war or a battle uh, comes to be real. The system, therefore, of continuity in sections and platoons, uh, of building up a corporate identity, a corporate spirit, of putting friends together, people who trust each other and know each other, is very, very important. And the buddy-buddy system of two men looking after each other, uh, looking after each other for such things as frostbite, trench foot, uh, and so on, and encouraging each other, um, particularly in, in defense and through periods of, of boredom, uh, also is very important indeed. Perhaps uh, I could appropriately finish with a reminder from uh, Clausewitz, who said in one of his books, that a soldier uh, should not, a soldier high or low, uh, should not have to encounter uh, in war things which, seen for the first time, set him in terror or perplexity. And I think if we bear that in mind in all our training, then we will be ready for war.